Welcome to the e-commerce growth show brought to you by Segmentify, the fast, lean learning machine, the fastest learning, most revenue generating personalization platform for e-commerce. Welcome to the e-commerce growth show. I hope you're all well. Now today I've got a, actually another great US guest and a, uh, I don't know if you guys uh, listened to the previous episodes, but uh, the last time I spoke to an American guy was a, a lad called Jimmy Hickey, who uh, he, he runs a business called uh, Finley Hats. He got me a great hat, as you probably know. I took a, I, I chucked a picture on LinkedIn. And, uh, but just in case Jimmy's listening, um, I'm still waiting for the kids' hats. So, uh, you know. Anyway, today, actually, we're, we're kind of doing something a little bit different. Um, I'm really excited to introduce a, a fantastic guy called Josh, Josh Boone. And... Um, He's uh, based out of Dayton in Ohio, and uh, he's he's an advisor, he's a speaker, and a strategist. And um, over the kind of last seventeen years, he's been working with many many founders, CEOs, and uh, CMOs through the agency that he has and uh, other um, you know consulting roles that he's done over the years. And at uh, at the moment, he runs a company called Pure Web Results. Uh, which is a consulting firm to uh, built to help DTC brands scale, uh, as well as align their teams and uh, optimize their customer journeys. So uh, I'm really pleased to uh, to welcome you, Josh. How are you doing? I'm doing awesome. It's it's uh, awesome to be here. You said uh, we were chatting earlier, and you were mentioning uh, that you you love a lot of things and you love to learn. And um, but one of the things you, you're quite passionate about is tea, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm drinking some right now. Uh, I've got a Taekwon Yin Oolong. Uh, I believe Very it's nice. from like the early 2000s, so it's kind of aged. Most people don't yeah. know that you can actually age tea. And yeah. uh, last last night, I was hanging with a friend of mine, and we had a a pu'er tea, which is like a fermented kind of aged tea. Yeah. Uh, that was from the 1970s. It's a 50 wow. year old tea. It's really hard to find. There's a there's a, a shop in Vancouver, complete opposite yeah. side of the the the, the, the continent. And uh, in, in Vancouver, he's got this tea shop mm -hmm. and he gets this stuff and he just sells it in really small batches because he's just like, I want people to be able to, to try this. He's like, I've had people come in here and want to buy everything, buy, buy the, you know, buy the entire like, you know, 1970s thing. These guys like, no, nope, yeah. no, nope. he's like just small amounts. I only sell yeah. it to individual people. I won't even like, I don't even think he will say, he said he'll sell it online just because he doesn't want people trying to, because he just wants people to be able to experience a tea like that old. That's like mm -hmm. legitimate because mm -hmm. there's a lot of fake fake aged yeah. tea nobody cared yeah. about aged tea pu'er tea in particular like, nobody really cared about yeah. it like 20 25 years yeah. ago and then yeah. all of a sudden it was just this huge craze so everything yeah. is so it's just like the prices went up astronomically and then everyone's rushing to yeah. try and like age tea because it takes a while so it's it's very kind of similar yeah. to uh what happened with wine i believe in like the 80s okay. and 90s like where it was just like nobody really cared about it now wine's exploding and like prices yeah. went up it's nuts, but I love I love tea. I've been yeah. I've been really in the tea for about twenty yeah. years now, so, so well, quite a while. So, and so, were you saying like when we were talking about earlier, is it a, a lifestyle thing or is it a combination of things? You know, like in terms of is it genuinely the taste of it or what? What is the actual element of it? Because I, I I've known other people that were big into tea and and even big into coffee, and I'm kind of not. So I was like, what, what is it for you that? That is, you know, great about it. Yeah, I mean, hey, I, I, I love the taste of it, and you know, also like, uh, the, the, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, a supplements like nootropics kind of guy, so I'm always like, uh, you know, body yeah. hacking and everything else. And the cool thing about tea, <laughs> what a lot of people don't know, is that what makes yeah. tea different from coffee is a is a uh, acid called like L-theanine. And what L-theanine is, yeah. is basically the, the what separates, it kind of synergizes with caffeine. So that's why, like, when you think of tea, right. you know, versus coffee, coffee, you just think you're just pounding it and you're just, like, getting all jacked up and you, you got all this energy and you're just like, ah. Uh, and, but uh, the down, that's, like, kind of the, 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 the you know, the, the good side of it in a way. Yeah, how much energy and clarity yeah. it gives you. The downside is, like, the jitters and, like, upset stomach and all yeah. this other stuff, uh, acid reflux. The mm -hmm. thing that helps make tea yeah. different is uh, mm -hmm. the fact that it has L-theanine, which helps curve the, the the jitteriness, and it actually helps calm you. So you uh, get that kind of – you get the energy, but then you mm -hmm. also get the calm. Yeah. 
Uh, so, you know, when you think of tea, you might mm. think of like, you know, some, some yeah. Buddhist monk chilling, you know, just pouring a tea and doing whatever you think of coffee, <laughs> yeah. you know, you might think of like, you know, a, a, you know, artisan coffee shop, a pour over, or you might think of, you know, a diner or whatever else. But like, you, it's, it's that yeah. the fact that like, you just can't drink too much coffee. Otherwise it kind of like has diminishing yeah. returns, whereas tea doesn't really have that. Yeah. But the thing that I like about the way that yeah. I, I personally brew tea, and I'm not like pretentious about yeah. it. Like, it's, it's just like, I'll, I will uh, make tea often in what uh, in in China it's called like grandpa style where literally you just get like a glass a tall glass and just throw some leaves in it and just pour water in it and you just keep pouring water in it throughout the yeah. day and just drinking it so it's like super uh -huh. chill whatever um, I'll do that sometimes but like the way that I have it right now with my whole tea setup is I have a little tea table yeah. which is like kind of like a, a platform with a bamboo top with slits in it so as you're pouring it and water fills it kind of goes into the tray and then it's got this thing called a gaiwan, yeah. which is like a little cup with a lid. Uh, and then you, you put the tea in it and then you put the lid on top and then you kind of use it to, to you know, to kind of pour it into a pitcher. And then that pitcher is yeah. what it helps it do is it helps it actually like kind of because uh, uh, the tannins will fall to the bottom. So the tea on the top, if you mm -hmm. just pour the tea from the top, like it's very light, doesn't really have as much flavor, but then the mm -hmm. bottom is like kind of bitter and like stronger. So you pour yeah. it in this pitcher and it kind yeah. of just mixes it all together. Uh, they call it a fairness pitcher usually for that, for that reason. Mm -hmm. And then you pour yeah. it into these, these yeah. smaller cups. But what I like about it is that most people, when they make tea, they, they have a tea bag or they throw some tea in a strainer or whatever else. And they'll pour, they'll get maybe one mm -hmm. or maybe two steepings out of it. And they're like, okay, I'm done. The way that yeah, like, yeah. Uh, you know, gung fu style, which is kind of what I'm just describing with, you know, the guy wants other stuff is yeah. you just put leaves, a lot of yeah. leaves in a small vessel and you're just pouring water in it pretty much constantly. So, you, you know, some mm. uh, you might get anywhere from like five to 20. I've gotten some really good teas up to 30 or 40 steepings and you just increase the the length of time in which you're you're steeping it for. Yeah. And what, but to, to, you know, to go back to what I really enjoy about it yeah. is that it's very meditative. It's yeah. very chill where I'll just be sitting yeah. at my desk, yeah. you know, uh, working yeah. throughout the day and I'll just pour some, some water in it. And it's almost like it gives you a nice little break mm -hmm. and it probably takes like 10 yeah. seconds to do. I'll just kind of stop. I'll get my kettle, pour it into yeah. it, pour it into the pitcher, sit, you yeah. know, pour the pitcher in, into the little cup. And yeah. the cup is just yeah. enough for like a yeah. couple sips. So yeah. you really appreciate yeah. it and you're like present for that moment. Yeah. And then you're like, yeah. okay, cool. And then you put the cup yeah. down and you go back to doing what you're doing. And like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, 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 it gets this kind of, a lot of people when they, when they, they hear about it and mm -hmm. they see it, they're just like, that just sounds very, you know, fluff or whatever, but it's really not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just, it's just chill. Yeah. And the thing is, whenever I show people yeah. how to make tea this way, they're like, this is cool. They're like, this is really cool. And yeah. a lot of people try tea and they're like, oh, I don't like yeah. tea or it's bitter, or it's whatever. But this is, I think, with most things in life, it's just like they didn't necessarily mm. uh, brew it right. And like, I, I and I don't mean that yeah. like there's plenty of people I've made tea and they're like, yeah, it's just not my thing. But like green teas, like we were talking about earlier, it's like green teas, uh, they need a lot lower temperature than like a black tea. So most people just take boiling water, pour it over the, 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 the you know, the tea and then it, like, it's very bitter. Yeah. But if you use a lower temperature yeah. tea and a shorter steeping time, like a minute maybe, uh, instead of you know three or four or five minutes, like some people do, it it doesn't have mm -hmm. that overbearing bitterness, and you actually get to taste the sweetness. And yeah. like my buddy, I was hanging out with yesterday, he he really yeah. uh, he didn't I, I you know he smelled the tea and he's just like man I don't think I'm gonna like this at all. And then he took a sip and he's like wow this is actually this is pretty good. And, and yeah, I think yeah, I yeah. That. He was just like, wow, this, this is. He was surprised. He actually was like, where can I buy this? Yeah. And I'm like, well, it's you can go to Vancouver, but yeah. <laughs> I found it a, sim a kind of a similar in in flavor. Uh, and and, and he's like, yeah. I'm gonna buy this. So it's it's just cool. Uh, you get to kind of control and do whatever. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I like I like the way that it, it helps you break the day up because I find that hard. I was just talking to my other half um, yesterday um, about that because I'm currently obviously working from home and i had been doing a lot of traveling beforehand and um, i still even though it's been say since march or april or something you know we're, we're now in kind of august and i'm still not really properly into a new routine yet you know like in terms of uh, fitness and stuff like that and uh, and sometimes i just find that the the things to do just kind of kind of fold oh, into yeah. one 
And then I don't take that break that I should, or don't take that breather or that lunch break and stuff. And I'm like, oh man, why am I feeling a bit kind of like strung up in my head and mm-hmm. in my body? And I can, I know why. So I'm like, man, I needed to get food today. <laughs> and, um, you know, yeah. Yeah. Like give myself a break. Yeah. I've, anyway. I've had to, I, I'm super, uh, I mean, I, I definitely struggle with ADHD. I have my entire life. So I'm just like, okay, this thing, this thing, this thing, but you know, running the business as long as I have, like I, I really had to yeah. hone that in and, and learn kind of my own internal yeah. coping mechanisms and learn how to harness it. And one of the yeah. things that I've done over the last <clears throat> year, I, I, I treat my life as like a series of David Bowie characters. Like I do something for two to three years and I'm like, okay, I did that onto the next thing, but I kind of do that on it, on it, on a, on a, a, a micro level, like where like, I will, I will find yeah. things like a, a couple, like I'll, I'll experiment. My life is like a series of sprints yeah. and experiments where I'm like, okay, I'm going to try this for a week. Like I do that even with like supplements. I'm like, okay, well I'm going to try Polygala mm-hmm. for a week and see how this reacts. You know, I, I'm going to try, okay, I'm going to try it in the morning. I'm going to try it in the evening. I'm going to try taking this supplement or this. I will try it with routines and whatever. And the thing that's really worked for me, there's two main things that have been like game changers for me in the last like six months. Yeah. Uh, one has been yeah. sauna. Sauna followed by a cold shower. So I yeah. got a sauna. And then people, oh, when man. I say sauna, they think that like, oh, you just, you got some yeah. like $10,000 thing built into your house. It's like, I, no, you actually can on Amazon buy a portable sauna for like a hundred bucks. It's crazy. So yeah, it's just like a yeah. tent and then you have like a steam generator. Uh, and I, I kind of rigged mine to have two steam generators going at once because I'm crazy. <laughs> and uh, I, I want to get it as hot as possible, but I will go into that thing. I'll yeah. do it in the morning. I did it be, uh, before this podcast. Like I'll get into it and I will just sweat yeah. until like I can't yeah. take it anymore. And then I'll get out and then I'll take an ice cold shower. And I come out of that and like, yeah. I don't really need like coffee or anything in the morning. Like I'll drink my tea, but that's like way more yeah. chill. I used to do like yeah. a cup of like a small cup of coffee and then like tea throughout the day, a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, other stuff. Yeah. I don't need it. Like the clarity is insane. And what it does is uh, quite amazing. Yeah. And the mm-hmm. second thing is just uh, schedule. So I've actually put into yeah. my schedule every day, like this is my available mm-hmm. time mm-hmm. slots to do, you know, things like this uh, podcast or whatever any sort of, any sort of, yeah. uh, you know, outreach or whatever. And then I have another one for client meetings, you know, have, this is like every day I've got on my schedule, like what that is. I've got periods where I can do whatever mm-hmm. else, but then what I do is two times a day for an hour, I'm like, this is break time, you know? And like, I, and, and sometimes yeah. I have to move that around, uh, and, and that happens, but yeah. I still yeah. keep that block on my calendar. I just move it. And, you know, I haven't been yeah. the absolute best at sticking to it, but I've gotten better. And that's all you really can do. It's iteration, you know, it's just tweaking things and testing things. So, so yeah, yeah I would, I would say yeah. like, you know, if sauna is not your thing, what, what is, you know, maybe it's going on a walk or maybe it's meditating, uh, which I, I try mm-hmm. to do in the mm-hmm. sauna. Uh, um, yeah, I will say, no, I love yeah. the sauna. I love that sauna. I, it's yeah. brilliant. And you, do you, do you get in it? completely or is it just your face um, or what? i have the the version where like you can get in just with like your body and then your head's out and i i don't like doing that i i i i, I it's just kind of no. weird i'll do that sometimes like if i've got like a bunch of emails i need to do so because you can have the little area yeah. where you can have your hands out but like I, yeah. I, I it's very rare usually what i'll do is just like get in it and i'll just put like towels on top of the tent thing and just like sweat as much as i i like being fully immersed like i like that yeah. i like the extremism yeah. of it um you know so like that's yeah. that's just me like i'm i'm gonna be uh, once i move into my next next house i'm gonna get a, a barrel sauna like a full-on wood barrel sauna like built and yeah, installed yeah. and oh, i'm that. looking forward to that so that's gonna that. be dope it's that's not it's not really yeah, no it's practical to do it in the place i'm in now because it's just like then you gotta move a barrel sauna that's not ugh. but but yeah yeah, no, it's, no. it's the sauna is a game changer. I, if if you enjoy the saunas, yeah, I agree. bucks, man, just buy yeah. one. It's not, it's 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 awesome. Yeah, I might well do, man. Do you know it's interesting you say that because I was going to the gym a lot when I was uh, traveling to London, and um and going to the gym, you know, yeah. like. But now we're in lockdown and stuff, or we're not. We're more remote. I'm not doing that. And actually, that's it's funny you should say sauna because that's the one thing I really miss. So I might actually look into it. I'll have to get you to yeah, send me a Yeah, yeah, I will. There's, it's crazy because like I, it's the same thing. I used to go to the gym and I, I predominantly went for yeah. the rowing machine, uh, which I really, really liked. Yeah. Everything else I can kind of do like weights yeah. at home or whatever. And there's a sauna, sauna and the yeah, rowing yeah. machine. Like those were the two things that I really, really like. And then I just started after the the yeah. quarantine stuff started here. I'm just like, I just buy a rowing machine, just buy a sauna. 
And I'm like, it's literally yeah. like if I just Completely, look yeah. at how much money I'm spending on yeah. the gym, it's just like just 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 do that. So yeah, yeah it's a game changer. Yeah. So now I, I so oh, yeah. I've been I've been trying to incorporate yeah. the row before the sauna in the morning. Uh but usually yeah. usually nice. I just do the sauna. Yeah. No, fair play to you. Well, I mean we could we could chat awesome stuff like this all day, right? <laughs> Definitely. Um <laughs> I mean yeah, so to sort of tease out um one particular area we, we talked about last time. Um that we wanted to sort of um, bring up on mm-hmm. this episode. It's, it's a little bit different, I suppose, really. I mean, um, we talked about um, culture. We talked about change. Um, and actually, me and you, you know, we, we talked about, you know, my previous experience about um, having had, uh, being in a sales career and sometimes coming into quite intense scenarios um, where there's big change, either either in some sort of rapidly scaling organization, whether that be, you know, an e-commerce retailer or whether it be, a SaaS business or, or whatever. I don't suppose it really makes much difference, but something like big mm-hmm. changes in that world. So say, for example, um, you're, you're in your role, you're in a team, you love it. You know, you're a great fit for that team. You've got plenty of autonomy and freedom. Um, and then all of a sudden, bang, something happens and you're like, oh man, this is, this has changed radically. And I'm now under threat, mm-hmm. you know, or I'm now being like, dictated to and managed and controlled where I wasn't yeah. before. Um, or, you know, now suddenly there's like the team is bigger and suddenly like trust is beginning to kind of dwindle, you know, um, or suddenly it's become really corporate and you, you don't understand how to, how to manage that because it's always been very chilled out and kind of personable. And now all of a sudden it's like you, it's almost political. Um, so I suppose we, we were talking about stuff about that, but the, the main question that came out of it, which I wanted to sort of ask you, especially since a lot of your experience has been talking to people about this kind of thing is how, because obviously it's inevitable, it's going to happen. So the question is, and this generally is coming from me as well, how does a person approach, handle, navigate through big change or what I mean, big inverted commas, like change that for you is a big thing mm-hmm. because something around you is changing. How do you navigate that? How do you approach it? What do you do about it? And so on. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. True. A hundred percent. So, I, I mean, I think it comes down to, there's two different perspectives that I have on this. Like well, for first is like approaching yeah. it. How do you as a human being, you know, approach change mm-hmm. in general, even outside of the yeah. context of, of business. And I think that totally, how you do that, will totally a hundred percent influence how you approach it from a business perspective. And then you've got the second, which is within the context of a business, whether you are say like the founder or you're a director or whatever else you're, you're in a leadership position, basically, how do you approach it? And then if you are an employee, how do you approach it from there? So you got kind of those two kind of sub layers and I, you know, so let's start with the the business side and then we can kind of transition to the personal Mm -hmm. side, but on the business side, like yeah. if we look top down, it's like, I think it's really important to understand why businesses change. And, and this is, there's, there's, there, it's, it really mm-hmm. comes down to incentive. So this is something that doesn't really get talked about a lot is, you know, what is the incentive structure? A lot mm-hmm. of times these businesses, you have a founder, sometimes, you know, I talk with founders. I'm like, okay, well, what's your purpose here? Like, what do you, why are you starting this business? And they'll be like, oh, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We, we want to, you know, we want to help the world and do this. And I'm like, why do you really want to do it? And they'll be like, oh, okay. I just want to build this up for the next four years and exit, you know? And I'm like, wow. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't think you and I are really, really aligned personally. Um, but I appreciate your honesty. Yeah. But the thing is, is like, that's, that mm-hmm. it happens. And the thing is, it's like, I kind of respect that more than the people that truly feel that way, but they're in denial mm-hmm. about it. And that's, that's an issue yeah. that happens a lot. So then you've got the founders that really believe in the mission and they're purpose driven. And they're like, Hey, how we want to do, I want to do good work. I want to try and help people. I want to try and help our customers help, you know, help maybe help the world or do whatever else. And, and like, those are people that really yeah. have the passion and, you know, they're kind of the, the bleeding heart types. And then, mm-hmm. so that's, that, that's that two perspectives, but then you're like, okay, how do they scale? And then this is what the biggest pivot is. And, you know, like with politics, mm-hmm. often it's just like, okay, what course of the direction of the co- is the country going? Like, if you know, if this party or this party gets elected or whatever, it's kind of like that with do you take VC money? Like, do you take investments from an outside group or yeah. do you just scale naturally? And that is going to completely change. Like 99.9% yeah. of the time, that is going to completely change the course direction of the business and the entire incentive model. I cannot tell you 
how many startups, you know, they're like a year or two years in and they're like, okay, we're, we're getting some traction. We're going in a good direction. We want, you know, this is our goal. And they have altruistic, really good goals. Their early employees are really excited and like they're starting to get some traction and they're like, okay, well, we're going to take, you know, our yeah. seed round and we're going to try and get mm -hmm. some money to be able to, you know, scale quicker. Mm -hmm. Sounds great until they they typically yeah. get taken advantage of and then you, and, and it just all goes awry and like how yeah. the vc model works i don't, don't want to go too far down this but i think it's important to have an idea how it works mm -hmm. is venture capital is basically a bunch of investors that then you have you have a vc firm that's kind of almost like a mutual fund they're pulling all this money and then their job is basically to kind of wrangle the 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 startups and and try to figure out okay who are we investing this money in and how do we help these startups like get where they need to be but th most vc firms are looking to ha basically exit like get get you know get their investment back within about yeah. five to 10 years. It's, it's typically, you know, it varies, but it's typically in the, you know, six, seven year, eight year, year period. And within that time, all they really care about, if we're peeling all everything back is getting that, uh, what the company's valued at when they, they start in the investment and what it's valued at when they leave, because that is how much money they're going to make. And so if a business was worth a million dollars when they invested and now it's worth a hundred million dollars, they just hundred X their investment. And everything outside of that is kind of a dog and pony show. Like a lot of times people think that the VC firms are like aligned with them and they often find that it's not once there's any sort of conflict. So how this happens with the organizations yeah. is that now these founders uh, are being pressured like, okay, well, we got to hit these, these revenue goals. We got to hit these things because they want to see that hockey stick growth. Nine out of 10, sometimes yeah. like nine and a half out of 10, you know, 90 to 95% of all startups just straight up fail. Mm -hmm. And the VC firms know this. So it's a numbers game. They, mm -hmm. they are looking for the unicorns. Mm -hmm. They're looking for the hundred, 200 X growth or whatever else, because that is how they make money. Yeah. So th all these yeah. startups get pressured into this crazy hockey stick growth. And that's where you see mm -hmm. things derail where I can't tell you how many, you know, early, you know, first stage employees are like super down with the mission, super down with everything. And they feel like that they're, they, they're really aligned and they feel really good about what they do. And then, you know, another year comes and they start seeing changes happening and they, they start feeling a little demoralized. And then year two and three comes and they're just like, this isn't the business that I, I started and yeah. I started with. And the thing is, is that you're right. It's not because the incentive usually changes. Yeah. And, and yeah. that's when everything starts to derail. So what that actually looks like in, 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 in actualization is, okay, you're now the, the it's, you know, it's changed that we got to hit these revenue goals. We got to hit these revenue goals, which I don't, don't get me wrong. Regardless, you always have to be sustainable. Like you always want to, you know, make money and do whatever, but it, it's like the, the priority yeah. and the incentive comes into showing uh, growth potential and, and continuously, you know, growing and growing and growing. And basically everybody that gets hired, this is another thing that happens. Everyone that gets hired now in these future positions yeah. is hired to meet yeah. those goals. And they, if you hire agencies, yeah. uh, you know, I ran an agency yeah. for six years and I think there's a lot of amazing mm -hmm. people out there that run agencies. I spent the last two years basically interviewing and just talking with and just meeting with as many consultancy and agency owners and founders as possible to try and talk about the model and like why, how, and what, you know, how it works, what the problems are. I fundamentally, after running one for six years, think that it doesn't matter how good your intentions are. The model is like very much so broken and there's, there's better, there's, there's, there's agencies that have, uh, that are more aligned than not. Uh, but, but to go back to the, the, the point is these agencies get hired on and they're usually put in channel specific roles. So, they're not working like in unison. And usually when you have this small team, you know, this kind of tactical scrappy team that is starting off, everyone's working holistically, everyone's working together and, and everyone yeah. feels unified and you feel like you have this team, you know, it's like you're a bunch of Navy SEALs. You're like, you, yeah. you, you, you feel like you're going into war together and everyone's working together and you're all on yeah. the same page. Well, you start hiring all these people yeah. that are basically meant to just work on a channel yeah. level. And then you hire the agencies, which are even more so, and they have their own teams and then trying to get those agencies to work together typically is like herding cats. 
And so you start getting all this fragmentation and that, ha that not only affects, you know, that not only bottlenecks your growth, usually like real growth, sustainable growth, I should say. Um, but it causes a lot of demoralization because now your yeah. team's not unified. And often you have all these people yeah. that are going off in different directions. And what's crazy is that you've got these teams that, uh, you know, like maybe one agency or one, you know, department is just doing social media and the other one's doing like SEO and content development. Another one is doing like, you know, uh, you know, PR or whatever. And they very, they increasingly will not talk to each other. And they, there's so much overlap over what they're working on and it, they just share their learnings. You know, that's kind of the tide that would raise all ships. So if you are in this business now and you were, you know, an employee two years ago, you're like, this is not the yeah. business that I was working for. And, and you start feeling no. really demoralized. And really what I found is that you start having people, there's all these different ideas of what the business is and what it's about and the direction mm -hmm. you're going in. And basically if you start seeing somebody else's idea of that business, start getting traction you're going to start feeling more and more demoralized because you're just like, that's not my mission. That's not what I'm here for. You know, that, and, and that often it, the problem is, is that what usually wins is, you know, what makes the most money, what hits the OKRs. And that yeah. often is not yeah. what actually is sustainable and what really in the long term truly matters. It's just random acts of improvement. And so often that just causes this demoralization. And then when you have the, the employees that are like, dude, we want to work on like this doesn't even make sense this is just this is just random putting out fires and just random stuff we want to work on this stuff that really matters that's going to like build this foundation and it's the stuff that you know the kind of work that we wanted that we were doing originally we want to continue and build on that and they're like yeah 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 but this thing over here like that this social media campaign like this stuff it's like it's great it's driving a lot of revenue right now let's just keep doing that keep doing it let's put the, all the time into it and it creates this total just demoralization and it, it can be a problem. And, you know, if you're talking about the incentive yeah. being like, Hey, we got to hit these OKRs. Like we got to hit this OKRs. It's like, what, what version yeah. of the story are, are you going to probably go with? If you're a director, is it the one that's, you know, making a lot of revenue or the one that's mm -hmm. like, you know, uh, yeah. feels right or whatever. Uh, and yeah. it gets, it gets difficult and there is a solution to it uh, and, and, and it can be course corrected yeah. for the most part. Um, it just kind of comes down to, you know, what is the culture? How do we align the culture and how do we get everyone on the same page? Mm -hmm. that, you know. So, you know, like talking about that from like the top down, I totally, I understand, you know, that if you're a leader of a company, then you've got to ask those questions that you're, that you're talking mm -hmm. about. Right. And, um, what what happens though when you're on the receiving end of it right so let's say from i don't know my scenario right you know or anybody who's in a senior role right e-commerce manager or whatever and they're reporting into a certain person and they've got some team colleagues and stuff like that and then there's a radical change to that business for whatever reason you know like like you just said funding comes in or vc is decided to to go down that route or private equity firm or, or whatever, right? New management come in because they want to drive the business forward mm -hmm. in some way. And then you become the receiving end of this new culture that seems to be seeping in. What, what does that, what did they, what did those people, you know, what do I do when that starts happening? Yeah. So I, I think it, it, there, there's a lot of nuance there and there's a lot of different ways that you could go about it. And, and a lot of it comes down to the yeah. culture and it comes down to who those people are and how you can, you can go about it. Like, Personally, how yeah. would I go about it? You know, if I'm, I'm that person, you know, you know, head of e-com or whatever, and I've got a marketing director or a CMO mm -hmm. or whatever else that, you know, just got brought in and is yeah. going things, you know, they got brought in because they're like, okay, this person came from this huge, you know, huge brand and they know how to scale and yeah. all sorts of stuff, but they don't really get, yeah. they don't really get, you know, truly the mission. Uh, I see that happen a lot. And, and, you know, if I'm, if I'm like the head of e-com, yeah. it's like, I'm, I'm probably going to try and have a pretty frank conversation with them. And I'm probably going to be a lot more frank than a lot of, you know, a lot of people would. Cause I, I've been an outsider, you know, my whole, my, my whole life. I've, I've always been yeah. on the outside. And, and, and the thing is, is like, how can you align, 
you know, I think I think that's what it comes down to. Like, how can you say, hey, what what is yeah. what is your like? What do you think the vision is here? What do you think the goal is here? And then assign uh, that, and then say, okay, well, how can we work towards trying to achieve you know what I want and what you want, mm-hmm. and come together mm-hmm. and and try yeah. and, and align yeah. that? And because what happens is that people start having like again, like they have the idea of what they yeah. think the business is and the direction, and then when you have these conflicting. Mm-hmm conflicting ideas mm-hmm. you start having like this yeah. you, you know you start having yeah. this uh mm-hmm. th- this issue where they're just you don't almost you almost don't want to help mm-hmm. them because you don't like mm-hmm. the direction it's going in yeah. and it's just totally unnecessary yeah. you start having this conflict demoralization people feel like they can't speak together yeah the, the most in, the, yeah. the worst yeah. that i see is when people that are in leadership positions mm-hmm. just basically justify bad ideas by saying like i feel and if you say I feel before like saying an idea yeah. and you don't have any sort of data yeah. to back it up, like you, you've already probably failed. Yeah. So, and that happens yeah, a yeah. lot. So the main thing is, is like, yeah. I think if you're in that position, I think a, you need to start with having a pretty frank conversation and just trying to just um, kind of, mm-hmm. I guess as two individuals try and just align and try and get on the same page. The yeah. second thing is, is yeah. th- it yeah. doesn't really even matter if, if uh, y- you know, that's successful or not. Uh, preferably it is, Mm -hmm. is like you kind of need to go in Mr. Robot mode and basically hack the incentive. So if you know that more or less the incentive here is revenue growth or this or that, it's like, how can you take the extra step? Think about how your ideas could, you know, kind of piggyback off of whatever else is being done and build on that. So like, I think all the time, like, okay, um, how, how can I, the ideas that I want, how can I kind of hack it so that it's actually bringing in a tremendous yeah. amount of revenue or, or whatever else. Okay, the cool. second thing okay. is, is how do you test that quickly? And that is the biggest thing, because if you say, yeah. Hey, we're going to do this big initiative that everybody wants to do big initiatives, but they don't do MVPs. They don't yeah. test it. And if you test yeah. it very, very quickly, then you're going to know if it's a success or not. And then you can take that data and say, Hey, like this is working. The, the biggest thing that when we try and come in and work with a business more from like the top down approach is, getting rid like uh, figuring out what all the assumptions on teams are and then how do we quickly test it mm-hmm. because what we want to do is basically create a a system like an idea meritocracy where like the best ideas are being vetted they're being tested and they win and it's not based on an ego so a lot of the times when we come in and we talk with you know people like whether it be you know head ecom or it be like the you know development team or it be product development or whatever you'll have all these, these employees that are just like, man, I am so sick of seeing bad ideas get implemented just because, you know, somebody feels like this is the best direction where if everyone is taking their ideas and we're just coming up with MVT, MV, uh, MVPs and just testing it and gathering that data, mm-hmm. well, now we let the data decide. Yeah. And so what this does is it removes yeah. the ego from it and everybody just tests things and it's really changed the culture. And I think it's a little more difficult to do that mm-hmm. if you're internal but I think that it comes down to like almost being like an entrepreneur and being like, how can you hack, how can you kind of hack the system to get what you want out of it? Um, mm-hmm. Very interesting. I mean, there's a few things I'm picking up on that. I mean, first of all, if you're a person who is on the front line and you're experiencing quite a strong culture shift, I mean, the first thing you talked about was, you know, talking to people about, you know, what's yeah. going on, right? which is interesting because that, you know, that would, it, where in a situation where, for, for example, you know, you're not the boss, you know, you're not a majorly senior person or you are senior, but you might have your own team, but you're not the boss boss, you know, you're not that CMO who, or whoever. That that must take quite a bit of confidence to be able to say, do you know what, you know, I'm not going to just sit back and let this culture kind of take me over. I'm going to, I'm going to sort of stand up. I'm going to be confident enough to start communicating back that I'm not comfortable with that culture and try and see whether you can navigate through it rather than just kind of letting it take Mm -hmm. over. Right. Um, So that's kind of an interesting thing because I think in terms of self-belief or having the guts really to be able to say, you know what I have, I do need a job, you know, and obviously everybody out there has got a different set of, um, you know, things that they, um, you know, financially are either going to be, you know, very well off or not so well off or, you know, surviving or whatever it might be. Right. So I suppose there must be a bit of a spectrum there in terms of how confident you are. But 
f- finding that confidence and sort of almost self belief to, to actually be able to say, do you know what, this culture is changing. I need to, I need to talk about it at least to see if I can make a change here. Is I don't know whether somebody would would automatically always default to that. And do you know what I mean? So what would be the what would be the message in a way to somebody who who even myself like I might be a little bit sort of you know too too nervous to say to do that what what's the what's the kind of you know what's the way that you you get yeah that confidence yeah in your life? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I've kind of been an outsider. Like my, I grew up in small business. My dad had a tree service. My mom had a cleaning service. I grew up going out on estimates with them since I was like seven, you know, (laughs) like, and going on jobs with him when I got older. And then I've been freelancing, uh, in digital since I was 13, you know? So it's just like, I've been doing this for so long. I'm kind of an outsider. Yeah. And what I would say is, you know, I know that kind of puts me in a, in a unique position, where I'm kind of a little calloused to it, but Mm -hmm. what I can tell you from the outside is that I see this Mm -hmm. happen constantly where people are afraid to have those conversations. And really it's like, you can either take action or you can allow life to basically make the decision for you. And that's what happens most of the time. I have these conversations with people and, you know, a lot of the time Mm -hmm. when I come in, uh, people, at first are a little skeptical because they don't know like, okay, are you, you know, are you kind of like, they're afraid to kind of open up because they're like, are you kind of just like a spy for the CEO or whatever else? But after a while they get to, you know, I'm always very honest about how Mm -hmm. I view things and people start to open up. And sometimes if they have managers or directors or whoever else that aren't really listening to them, I'll start, it's basically like, they'll start really venting to me and telling me how they really feel. And it's like, I, never discourage you know, I never encourage somebody to leave their job or anything but what I do tell them is like no. hey um you need to act on that like you need to have these conversations yeah. and I'll just say if yeah. you feel like you're not yeah. if you all I would say is like what are you optimizing for yeah. and I'll, I'll just ask them yeah. that. like just ask yourself what are you yeah. optimizing for in your life yeah. and if you yeah. feel like this yeah. job is not aligning with that yeah. then you need to either find a way to fix it yeah. or you need to leave yeah. Because the thing is, it's not yeah. doing the company any mm-hmm. service because you're going to be demoralized yeah. and you're not going to be doing your best work. And inevitably, yeah. it's yeah. going to blow up. And that's what happened. Yeah. Like people in general yeah. are just yeah. way that's too passive. Mm-hmm. Like they just kind of allow life yeah. to happen to them. And like, look, I get it. Yeah. Like, you know? Yeah. But it's a very good point you make, though. I, I, you know, for me, that, asking that question and getting the answer from you is bang on for me because. It, and I know this from myself, I'm sure everybody out there has been in situations where there's been big change in the business and you've ended up like being kicked out or you've been ended up being, you know, sidewinded out or backstabbed or something. And it's because it happened anyway, yeah. because you didn't say anything. So actually, hold on a minute. What's, what is there to lose actually when you know it's going to go down the wrong way kind of anyway? Why let it happen? Why not actually see if, like you've mentioned, there's a couple of things there which you could actually turn that around. If A, you had the confidence to go and say, do you know what, actually, things are changing, man. This isn't, this, I don't think this is the most appropriate way to optimize this team going forward. And can I ever talk to you about that, right? And so I love that in terms of the reason is because if you don't do that, you're probably going to be gone anyway. Because yeah. I even know that from my own experience where I didn't speak up to teams or, or in, in that scenario where in actual fact I've had both, but say in a scenario where you haven't bothered and then you've just like um, a few months have gone by or whatever. And you sat in a boardroom and somebody says, it's, there's just no culture fit. And you're like, you yeah, know, I knew that was coming, man. You know, I didn't do anything about it. I just saw it. Um, and then eventually that culture misfit just, just ended me out yeah. of a job, you know, um, which is very interesting. And then the other thing I just wanted to pick up on was when you mentioned the hack, the incentive, which is quite a cool strap one, actually. I might use that in the title of the podcast. Um, <laughs> Uh, Josh Boone and Hack the Incentive. It. But um, yeah, man, it's cool. But um, I'm thinking that I like that in the sense that you're trying to be clever, right? In you see a situation and rather than going, oh man, I hate this situation. This is doing my nutting, you know? I And then maybe the, the idea of having to talk to somebody. Yeah, fine. Okay. But what happens if you could like be clever and say, do you know what, actually, I'm going to use this to my advantage and find out where I can pivot, mm-hmm. right, to maximize 
the situation I now find myself in. That's an interesting take as well, because rather than being reactive to the situation, you're actually letting go of that and becoming more proactive in that moment, mm -hmm. right? No, 100%. I mean, I, I think you have to be proactive in every aspect of your life. You know, I mean, there are certain times yeah. when strategically it makes more sense to just let things play out and just kind of watch. But even that is an yeah. act of being proactive because you're doing it with intent. You're not allowing it to yeah. happen passively. You're like, okay, my best move on the chessboard right now yeah. is just to wait and let these yeah. two sides hack themselves to pieces and then I'll come in, swoop in and, and deal with what needs to be yeah. done. Um, and, and like, yeah. if you want, I, I would say like, if you want a, a good mm. example of like mm. how to do this, uh, funny mm. enough, watch Mr. Robot. Literally, that is the entire plot of Mr. Robot is he just sees weaknesses yeah. and opportunities and then constantly pivots and does it. And he does this even mm -hmm. on a second to second basis. Mm -hmm. Like it's, 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 it's an amazing show. Very, very uh, underappreciated. But what is it? Mr. Yeah, Robot, Mr. Robot. It? It's basically it kind of starts off like the, about a hacker that basically wants to try and like, yeah. uh, I don't know reset the, the reset yeah. society but he he get, he infiltrates right. in a corporation and he kind of like basically figures yeah. out okay how can i hack these systems not only like hack the actual yeah. technological systems but hack yeah. people and he he, he thinks yeah. of like uh people as yeah. being hackable and like that is the perfect yeah. example and i don't mm -hmm. mean like i don't mean that yeah. in a in a negative uh manipulative sense but that can that can be utilized for good it's like with everything in life yeah. uh yeah. that most of the time yeah. Yeah. these strategies kind of get hijacked mm -hmm. for uh malicious intent but they can be utilized for good as well and i'm yeah. always thinking about okay how can i hack this situation mm -hmm. and just get to the point because literally yeah. you think about people often just mm -hmm. think about themselves and it's like the zig ziglar yeah. concept it's like if, if i help if i just constantly yeah. help everybody around me then like i will never yeah. have an issue in yeah. life because i will end up the, what yeah. is the tide that raises all ships it, it is constantly thinking about how you can help other people mm -hmm. and if you do that yeah. selflessly and you yeah. really help people they will rise up mm -hmm. people always like they're, they're yeah. this rat race they think about mm -hmm. how they can get ahead mm -hmm. they can get ahead my entire life I have always succeeded because yeah. I've made everybody around me rise and I rise with them yeah. and, and I have this network yeah. and it's strong and we're all helping each other. So yeah. think of that as an employee. Yeah. And like, if you have a boss that you really don't align with, what are the, how can you help them help their goals and, and how can you direct them in a way yeah. that you want to go to? Because if you sit there and you're like, Hey, yeah. this is this initiative that I really think that we need to do. And I, this is something that is a passion project for me. And I think this actually is like mm -hmm. what the direction the business should go in. Okay. Take the extra step. Think about how does that align yeah. with the business's incentives and how does it align with your boss's incentives and how can you make it stupidly easy where it's like a no brainer yeah. not to do it. It's hard. It's hard work. It's yeah, not yeah, easy, yeah. but nothing in life is easy. Yeah. Like you can either choose to do that no. uh, and be proactive about yeah. it. Or just sit there and suffer yeah. in silence until eventually either you're let go because you're a buzzkill and you're not you're not you know you're not aligned with the team because that's the other thing if that boss and you and them yeah. don't align, uh, you're basically just going to be coasting until they have an excuse to bring somebody else in that's more aligned with their direction and you're on a ticking time clock. And no, yeah, completely. yeah. So I mean, then again, there's a few things in there, right? But one of the things that strikes me is you mentioned the word <clears throat> selflessly, yeah. right? Now that is a very powerful word. It's a very interesting word because that can be, I, mean, I don't know, I suppose my, my ultimate question regarding that is that what, what do you mean by selflessly? And what I particularly mean by it is how, what drives you if you're genuinely being selfless in those actions? I mean, I, I, I think that everything if we're going back all the way to the core is selfish in nature. Like, I, I think it's impossible yeah. not to like, if I'm, you know, yeah. but it's like by going Agreed. on this podcast, it's like, okay, I'm helping you with content yeah. and all this other stuff, but also yeah. it's helping me as well. And it's just like, yeah. uh, yeah. you know, if I, you know, mm -hmm. if my, 
my partner, you know, that I, mm -hmm. I live with, like, yeah. you know, it was like, okay, I'm doing things with her. I, I love her and all these other things, but it's like, why at the end of the day, are you doing yeah. that? It's because it's companionship. Yeah. It's this, it's that. It's like, so if you really go yeah. back everything, sure. even if it's selfish, however, yeah, okay. there's a okay. strong cool. difference between, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. being yeah. altruistic, I guess, and, and, and not, um, I, yeah. I, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, that's not what I was going to say. Yeah, to me, completely. it's like I just like helping people. You know, if you're asking me personally, it's like I like yeah. helping people yeah. and I like yeah. seeing things get better. And like we, we live in yeah. a, a beautiful yeah. yet also nightmare society. And it's just like I think, you know, it's like we yeah. can make things better. You know, yeah. we can make things better on a day to day yeah, level yeah, yeah. personally yeah. Yeah. with, you know, the missions yeah. that we, we have with these companies uh, culturally and all these mm -hmm. other things. So it's just like how, how can I help? Yeah. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's the whole thing like the enemy of the enemy yeah. is my friend. So it's just like, if you think about, yeah. okay, if you have a boss that you're not super aligned with, um, what is their mm -hmm. enemy? Well, the enemy is they need to make these yeah. certain goals because they want to keep their job, because they want to keep their family sure. safe, because they have <laughs> all these things. Yeah, they, yeah. Every single fear and yeah. concern and whatever, often the people that are mm -hmm. the biggest dicks, the people that are mm -hmm. the most difficult to work with, yeah. they're usually yeah. like really sad. And they're really desperate and there's yeah. so much pain. Yeah. They need they help. help right? So yeah. like that's usually mm -hmm. where they're projecting all this anger out to the world because they don't know how to deal with themselves. So if you take a step yeah. back and be like, what yeah. is their incentives, mm -hmm. both personally mm -hmm. and professionally? Okay. Now that I know what it is, yeah. how can I yeah. help them accomplish their thing, yeah. but accomplish yeah. what I want yeah. to at the same time? Let's work together. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So on that then, right. If I if I give you as one last scenario, right, to kind of cap yeah. this off, this this brings in one final thing. So I think there's some brilliant stuff in there, um, which we can summarize in a minute. But let's say we are proactive, hacking the incentive, mm -hmm. right? Josh Boone styley, and um, a you don't you 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 end up um, not wanting to, okay, because it's attacking your personal values too much for argument's okay. sake, right? And or you fail at hacking the incentive, right? Because nobody's perfect, man. You know, nobody can perfectly hack that incentive to make sure that that's culture. They can fit that new culture that then that's now being impressed upon them, all right? Or they just damn don't like it. It, it isn't going to change. Yes, they're pivoting, but they don't like the pivoting of it. It's a bit rubbish. They don't feel very good about it, even though they're doing it, right? Um, and let me give you an example of that, right? So in one of my roles, which I hasten to add is not the current one, any of my uh, team <laughs> listening, <laughs> Um, I was in a company where there was very much a culture of fear at mm -hmm. the top. And so you were humiliated. You were made to feel um, secondary. Like all you really should have been is some kind of lapdog, you know, some kind of yes man or yes woman to the management. Right. And that's how they wanted it. If you didn't fit that mold, then that was in, that was, you know, throughout the organization, basically. So is, is there a time, I think you did mention it earlier, but like, do you think there was a time when, you know, you just have to say, do you know what, I've given it a go. Um, I need to be almost self-confident enough to just move away from this and just get yeah, out. Leave. I mean, it's that simple. Just leave. There are yeah, hundreds okay. and thousands of businesses okay. out there that you can work with. Like mm. me, me yeah. and, and uh, one of my colleagues are like sitting here and we're kind of like developing a new sales system. And like, so I'm just like looking at, some of the raw data that he's yeah. got of like, you know, LinkedIn and, and Crunchbase mm -hmm. and all the, all these like resources of all these businesses. And we're just kind of doing searches, like who our yeah. ideal clients are. And there's just so yeah. many of them. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And if you're just looking to work for a business, it's even more so. I mean, it's insane how many yeah. businesses are out there. Just leave, yeah. you know, I, I, yeah. I mean, fine. Yeah. I think don't just I'm say, I'm you know, yeah. uh, you know, I'm yeah. out. We, but like, come up with a game plan. You know, I, I, people, people yeah. are just like, well, that's yeah. easy for you to say. It's like, no, I've done it. I've done it. I left my own business. I started a business, the agency, yeah. and I was just like, I don't, this is not aligned with what I want to do anymore. So what I did was I, I, yeah. I really thought about it. I ended up taking a weekend off and I just went up into this, this little town about three, four hours away by on a lake and this little, mm -hmm. little town. I, I just chilled there. I had some headphones and a pad of paper and a pen, and I just kind of walked around and just thought like, okay, 
the questions I would ask myself yeah. are ultimately what I, what I got out of it. I mean, I, I kind of like figured all this out, but the, the consolidated form, what I recommend mm-hmm. to people is to ask yourself, what are you optimizing for in your life? And I mean this very yeah. broadly, you as a human being, what yeah. are you optimizing for? And is that your family? Yeah. Is that your mental health? Is that, you know, just personal satisfaction? Is that the fact yeah. that you feel like you're accomplishing a goal or is, is that financial? Is it whatever? Yeah. What are you optimizing yeah. for? Like, what would you do yeah. if like money was not an object? Um, you know, that's maybe one yeah. way you could look at it. Or if you had to mm-hmm. work for money, yeah. uh, which obviously most people do, yeah. what are you going to mm-hmm. be most satisfied on? And you might find yeah. yourself saying like, okay, well, actually, I really like the business that I'm working with. It's just these one or two things that I don't like. Okay, well, now that's your problem. Okay, that's your that's your thing that to work mm-hmm. on. Now, strategize. Mm-hmm. You know. Now, let's say for example, you're like, ah, yeah. uh, I don't like this. I don't like what I currently have. Well, it's you either fix it, like I just said, or you leave. It's it's that simple. Yeah. If yeah. you your inaction yeah. is going yeah. to create not only misery, hey, anyway. but it's going to, yeah, it's literally going to set yeah. the conditions where it's yeah. going to be made for you yeah. and you are going to be blindsided yeah, 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 yeah. and that's going to yeah. be bad for everything, yeah. your family, you, yeah. everything. Yeah. Completely. Well, look, I mean, to me, the bottom line of a lot of what we've talked about today is, is, is self-belief, is yeah. confidence, is knowing when, when, when something happens and the culture changes that you as a person, you know, have the inner strength to be able to face up and take control of your own. I know it sounds a bit cheesy, but take control of your own destiny in that, in that moment. And I suppose, I mean, you, you do a lot of, <clears throat> I mean, for, you know, forgive me if I'm wrong here, but you, you, from your job, your experience and stuff, you, you do like mentoring and coaching and stuff as part. Yeah. Of it, right? Yeah. I mean, it didn't, it, it wasn't originally intended for that, but it, it, it you know, as yeah. I've been doing this yeah. uh, for in its current yeah. iteration for three years now, after leaving my last business, I took about two years off to travel yeah. and and yeah. then I started this. Yeah. Originally, I wanted to focus more on, yeah, like organizations and teams. But then as I started, I'm like, wow, yeah. okay, it became necessary yeah. to start doing that. So, yeah. so yeah, that's definitely a part yeah. of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, brilliant. Well, I mean... For me, there's been some pretty cool takeaways. Um, I'm going to go out and get a sauna off Amazon, I think. Straight away. <laughs> I mean, how it goes. Um, I'm going to, is it? Yeah, I will. And uh, what is it, this Mr. Robot thing? Is that a book or uh, a it's program? It's a TV or? show. It's like four seasons. It's it's TV completed. Show, right? it, it was on AMC okay, cool. here in the, the States. But it's, is it, it is okay. well, gonna... amazing. If you're a fan of, uh, say, you know, Breaking Bad, uh, the Sopranos, yeah. any of that stuff. If you liked, yeah. you know, David Fincher, like the social network or any of that stuff, just, just watch it. It's amazing. It yeah. is, it is artistic. That's, that's I, I originally cool, wanted to be a filmmaker many, many, many mm-hmm. years ago. Uh, oh, wow. and from, I, I'm yeah. kind of a film nerd and it's one of the yeah. best technically created yeah. cinematography, the writing, the score, yeah. everything that I, I've ever seen. It's, it's, cool. it's up there. It's amazing. So I give that, give them give it a watch, but I think it'll, nice. if you want to figure out like yeah. how quite, quite literally, yeah. if you want to figure out like, okay, how can I be more like this? Watch it because Elliot, yeah. the main character is, has extreme social anxiety and is not assertive yeah. at all. And you literally see how he goes and does it. And I think it's interesting. I'm not saying get, try, and, try and hack society, but I think it'll give you yeah. a day-to-day. Uh, I think I think it'll it'll kind of uh, give you an idea. So, so give, it, give it a watch. It's fun. Yeah, I know. Totally. Totally. Um, so, I mean, on all the great stuff we've talked about, um, what would be the best way that uh, our, our listeners could get in touch with you on any of this kind of stuff, whether it's everything from sort of, you know, the coaching side and the, uh, uh, and the cultural side through to obviously, you know, the other core parts of what pure web results focuses on. Um, what would be the best way to get hold of yeah, you? Yeah. Uh, you can go on our website, purewebresults.com, uh, or you can hit us, hit me up on yeah. uh, LinkedIn. It's just LinkedIn, I think forward slash Josh Boone, uh, B-O-O-N-E. But yeah, uh, just shoot me, shoot me a message on there or whatever else. Uh, if you want to follow us on, yeah. on LinkedIn, uh, we got a podcast starting in a couple of weeks. So if you've enjoyed hearing me talk, <laughs> I'll be doing a lot of it. So I'd love to have you on. I think it'd be fun. Cool. You have a round two. Hey, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And obviously any of the listeners out there, you know, do get in touch if you uh you want to be in touch with Josh about what he's doing and um and uh you know if it's get some advice on what, what the best tea is at the moment to, oh, to go for. I got right? a lot. I haven't quite made that leap yet. I got a yeah, lot. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
I'm, I'm definitely going to check this one out and I'll, I'll let you know how we get Sounds on. Sounds good, right. brother. This has been awesome. Brilliant. Yeah, so it just remains for me to, to finish off and say um, thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, as always, do uh, chip over to segmentify.com forward slash, uh, forward slash even um, podcast to uh, get all the episodes that come out and all the future ones and so on. And any questions, anything you have for any of the speakers or myself about you know, subjects and new topics where you want to be involved, uh, just ping me at phil at segmentify.com anytime. But uh, yeah, thanks, Josh, so much for an awesome chat. Thank you. No worries. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll speak to you all again soon. Put us to the test and let us prove we can drive more revenue for you. Sign up for a completely free proof of concept or split test against your current provider. Set up and optimized by our team within a few days at segmentify.com slash demo.